Well, just uh, good to be together. Just want to welcome those that are joining us online. Thanks for everybody for... And it wasn't even that hard this morning, was it? It was pretty nice out there. I was here last night preparing, and the, the rain was, was going sideways, you know, <laughs> like underneath, and just the water was getting everywhere. But uh, it's good to see it dried out a little bit this morning. I want to encourage you, let's open up our Bibles to Hosea. This is kind of an uh, Old Testament. But I want to share something with you. I've got a couple PowerPoint slides to help me along here. So I had finished reading through the New Testament, got through Revelation, and then I was just asking God, God, where do you want me to go next? And he, he drew me to uh, some of the minor prophets here. So this is where I started. Hosea is one of the first ones. So I just want to show you in the Old Testament kind of like some blocks of reading. Because when you're reading a certain passage, you need to know where you're reading. You can't just jump in and start assuming some things. Like You need to have some foreknowledge. So now the first slide I have here is of the first five books of the Bible. So we look at the, the Torah or the Pentateuch, however you want to uh, look at that. The next section is of uh, the historical books. So again, if you're reading one of these books, again, just know what you're reading. Uh, the third section here is what we call of maybe a books of wisdom or you know some kind of learning we, we would get out of that. And then we look at the major prophets, so we jump into there. And really, the, the dif difference between major and minor is just the length of book, most of it. And so we look at the minor prophets, which we're going to spend our time with uh, this morning. So a good chunk of books in there and the minor prophets. So the very first book, I thought, okay, Lord, let's get into Hosea. Let's just read through that and, and see where it lands. And so understanding the book of Hosea, just a couple tidbits here. So this is a collection over 25 years of writing and preaching. So it's kind of like the, the cream of the crop. You know, we put this book together. Hosea, if we look at it in the original terminology, is very similar to that of uh, Joshua's. And that, mean, that word means a uh, savior. Uh, so we look at Joshua was going to be the savior and help get God's people into the promised land. Well, Hosea is entering in here as one of the first voices in the prophetic writings that is going to bring salvation to a broken nation. And so some of the words that he uses in the terminology, and the, really the, it's prophetic, but it's also like poetry. You've got to remember, you're reading through those uh, minor prophets. It really, it's, it's poetic if you read it. You almost sing some of these songs. Lots of these songs would come out of here. And so at least we've got a bit of an understanding. So we'll jump in in verse 1, or verse 2, I apologize. Because verse 1 has a lot of terminology and names that are really hard to pronounce. So we're just going <laughs> to jump into verse 2. You go back and read it. I'll preach it later on, I promise. But verse 2 is where it really jumped out at me. When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go take to yourself an adulterous wife and children of unfaithfulness, because the land is guilty of the vilest adultery in departing from the Lord. And I just, I had to pause there. I just, all of a sudden, I had lots of questions. I just thought, I can't get past that. I've got to go do some research. I've got to understand, wh what? And don't you read the Word of God, especially in the Old Testament? You're like, there's just some things you're like, I, I have a question, Lord. Like, I want to know, kind of explain some of these things with me. So, three points. What is happening historically? Tell me some context of what's going on here. Second point, which we all are probably wanting to ask adulterous wife why lord are we you know we need to know that's number two we'll kind of put it in the middle there and then we'll finish off like what does that actually mean today what does that mean to me personally why would that story resonate with me today in the new testament in my relationship with god so we'll look at those three so let's jump into the first point so really what's going up and what's happening when the lord began to speak through hosea okay so he's speaking through he's a prophetic message to the people what else is going on at that time you know, we, we know that uh, Joel, we look at some other uh, minor prophets, Amos, Micah, Jonah, um, Isaiah. These are some of the people that actually were alive at the time that hadn't quite started speaking yet. Hosea is the first mouth. He's the first one saying, this is wrong what you're doing. We've got some red flags going up here. God gives Hosea the first message. And it would make sense if you think about Jonah. Later on, we would see about a story about Jonah. God's calling Jonah, go to Nineveh and tell those people to repent. They're wicked, they're evil, they're vile. And Jonah's like, 
He's had the story. He's read about Hosea and about how God is so compassionate. We're going to read in just a little bit that he's like, I don't want to go there. Those people should die. They're wicked and nasty. And Jonah's like, he knows God's heart. How does he know God's heart? He, he probably knows God pretty well. But he has stories like this one to know that God is going to show compassion and mercy. And so that's why this is such an important book. Again, Hosea is like the first voice. He foretold the destruction of Israel. They're going the wrong way. And, and you think with this thought that it would be the first that would carry out such an unpleasing message. I don't think I would want to sign up for that as the prophet. God, there's six other prophets around. Why don't you get one of them to speak up on behalf of us? I'm going to go out there and stand alone on my own mountain, fl- waving a flag of like, they're wrong, they're, they're in trouble, Israel's going the wrong way. Why would I be the, I'll, I'll be the second one. I'll, you know, you make the motion and I'll second it, right? You know, like, you know, maybe something like that, right? No, he has to be the first voice. So a second thought here, again, is that it's the first voice that he's speaking about the Israelites as they're having idolatry. They're they're far from God. And and it's used in the terminology here of adultery. There's a story here about adultery that we're reading about. But it's really a form of idolatry. That that you're, you're not in relationship with God anymore. You've broken the covenant with God. And God is judging that. He's he's talking about that. And Hosea here would would probably be like many of us. Well, God, what about my reputation? You know, God, I haven't had time to build relationship with these people so that when I speak into their life, I built a nice bridge across to their life. And now when I talk to them, they'll listen. No, Hosea comes on the scene just like this bold, you know, the first one. All the Israelites are in the land of milk and honey. Like, woohoo, feet are up, you know, relaxing. And all of a sudden... You know, Hosea's coming with like, you're wrong. What you're doing is not good. And the Israel's, whoa, man, you don't, they're not excited about that. The, Hosea's not like, you know, a good friend now. You're like, I, I don't know that guy anymore. I, I don't like that guy. I don't like what he's saying. And so there's this bit of uh, concern. Man, my reputation really kind of trumps us sometimes. It really challenges us like, Lord, you know, what about my, you know, But I've, you know, I I don't know if I could give that up or I don't know if I have, you know. And we we question that, but God is like, I have something to say. And so Hosea, I don't know how strong he was in his voice when he said these things, but he definitely was the first one to say it. And why is that so important? So if we were to be in the New Testament for you and I, this is what we do, like Hosea. We read this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23. The Apostle Paul is teaching us to live a certain way and to say certain things. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. When we preach Christ to people that are unsaved, often it sounds foolish. You know, there's a God that loves you. There's a God that sent his son to the cross to die for you. God has an eternal destination for you. That's foolishness to people that are not saved. I remember I listened to that probably for five years before I was saved. I thought, that's crazy. You have no idea what I've done. There's no way that God would love me. He is rejecting me. I'm a fool. Those are the kind of thoughts we have. But we preach Christ crucified, just as Hosea did. We just preach the truth. We just preach the gospel. We just preach Jesus. And however people respond to that is their choice. We don't have control over that, do we? But we've got to speak it. Because otherwise we're sometimes afraid, aren't we? Again, of our reputation. This might sever the relationship. I have family members that I have to share this with. And I'm like, ooh, maybe we might not be family members much more after this conversation. But we have to preach it. We have to share it when God gives us the moment. And so God spoke, again, boldly to Hosea to speak that. You know, not only did he speak boldly, it's actually, here it is. It's written down. We get to read about it. So it's not just a, a make-believe story or maybe, maybe it happened. No, it's actually written down as a witness, as an, an eyewitness account. And what Hosea is doing here for the people of Israel, he's, he's saying to them, hey, it looks good. And so often in our lives, hey, it, it just feels right. This is a good thing, right? And we kind of keep it hidden. And what Hosea is doing, like looking through the looking glass, he's, you know, like binoculars, he's saying, but look at this area right here that's not good. 
And so he's saying, you've got to pay attention to those things because it's, it's sinful, the things that you're doing. And so let's get to point number two, which I'm sure you've all been waiting for. Yeah, okay, we've got a good foundation, but you know, explain this little, this crazy left field curveball coming at us. So why would God ask Hosea to marry an adulterous wife? It's not crystal clear in here as well as that she did live, she had other kids, so you know, she did live an adulterous life, or it happened after as well. So you know, there's open for discussion on that one. But Hosea was ordered to take Gomer as his wife. Go take to yourself an adulterous wife and children of unfaithfulness. Not one that had been married and then committed adultery, but that was going to again commit adultery. Because if she was married and she was committing adultery at this point in history, and we've read this before, they would stone her to death. And when it says that they had many children, it would be very obvious. It wouldn't be like, um, is she married or did she just find that kid or adopt that kid? But after a couple kids, somebody's going to be like, I have a question. You know, this woman's obviously caught in adultery and this isn't the real father and this kind of stuff. But it doesn't say that. She's living this single life, this single state, and she's lived very scandalously. And she's had kids that are, un, what is the word here? It says, un, what is the exact word here? Um, of children of unfaithfulness. So again, if you were faithful to your husband, it would be fine, but it's not. And so to take a woman like this is like, it's indecently not good. It's not respectable. You know, as somebody as the voice of God is now married to her. What? Like again, those don't go together. What about, you know, poor Hosea's reputation? What about his relationship or his authority to speak when he's living with somebody like that? But God, for Whatever reason said, this is a good thing. I want you to go do this. I want you to marry this woman. She's going to commit adultery on you. She's going to end up owing money. And you're going to have to go and redeem her. And show her how much love you have for her, even in the brokenness of this relationship, as a prophetic symbol of God's relationship with you and I. This is the point of it. Is that when you have a spouse and they commit adultery and run away, the pain of that. And God is saying in the same context, I'm in a loving relationship with you, and when you choose somebody else or something else, do you feel the same pain that I might feel? Whoa, man, that's a wake-up call, isn't it? I, over the 20 years, even this was happening even in retail, when I would sit with somebody that had been cheated on or they had cheated, Man, you can't even put your finger on I can't even explain that to you. It's like the oxygen in the room just left. There's pain, there's grief, there's unforgiveness, there's resent. I mean, it just the list goes on and on and on. All of that pain. And when we are in a relationship with God and we let him down or we feel like we've done, we've sinned, we've, we've kind of messed it up, we feel like we may have, like, God's not going to trust me. You know, I've gone behind his back. I, I've turned to like worldly idols. I've robbed God. I've cheated God. How can he ever trust me again? All these feelings, all this pain that's going on. And God looks at that. And that's what's important for you and I today. As God looks at our stuff, how does he feel? And do you see what happened so clearly in the story? He went out, Jose went out, paid the debt. We got Jesus, paid our debt. He brought us back. He redeemed the relationship. We were running from the relationship. He redeemed us and brought us back. We weren't looking for it. We were caught up in our sin, caught up in our, we use the word idolatry, caught up in other things. And here again, the story is adultery to help us make that connection. Do you you kind of get that connection? You feel that? And God, in all of his mercy and grace, he just never, never gives up on us. See, God asked Hosea again to marry Gomer, to love her unconditionally and bring her back into his life. We would read later on that she's going to bear him three children. I didn't want to read it as well because some of the names that they named the children is hard in English, you know, today's terminology. But with her prostitution, it brought her back into slavery. 
And in utter humiliation, Hosea has to go and again redeem her and save her and bring her back out of slavery. And that's our relationship with God. We see it time and time again in the Old Testament. We, we keep wanting to go back, right? We get out of Egypt. We get out of slavery. And what's the first thing we do? Oh, God, you're, you're not providing. Let's go back. We always want to go back to something. And God is saying, no, I want to be in a relationship. You stop running from me. What's the point of this message? God's love for us is so radical and goes to such ridiculous lengths. Listen to again what it says. We talk about, it seems almost foolish, right? You know, God's given us everything, and we constantly choose something different. We constantly go somewhere else. And this message isn't about us. You know, please hear me. This is a message about just beating us up. A bunch of knuckleheads and idiots. We just were fools. We just mess everything up. No, this is about a loving God who sees you in all that and goes, you're never going to be perfect. You're never going to get it together. You know, you're going to get some of it together. You're going to work on it. You're always going to be working on it. It's always going to be a process, but I'm always chasing you. You might be running from me. You might not have it all together, but I am pursuing you. And it would look like foolishness to some people. In 1 Corinthians, let's go back there just for a sec. We're going to kind of unpack a little bit more of what uh, the Apostle Paul was saying there. It says, where is the wise man in verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolishness the wisdom of this world? You know, when we would read that, we almost might see it's not a little bit foolish of the way God's handling that situation. For since the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Do you see how clear that is? It's not just about a bunch of head knowledge and wisdom. It's about the foolishness of how much God cares for you. Wow, isn't that just a wonderful thought? Verse 23, Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach again, Christ crucified. And it's really a stumbling block to those that don't know God. It's a stumbling block and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those who God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness, the foolishness of God. We would read these things in the Old Testament. We think God's foolish for allowing that to go on. Why would he just give them, why would he take them back? God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom. And if there's even such a thing as, it's written here in the word of God, the weakness of God. If there's even such a thing as that, the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength that we don't really have the voice or the wisdom or the strength to question what God is doing because he knows, because he's perfect, and he has such a great plan for us. After all this foolishness had happened, in a sense, with Hosea, which seemed you know, pretty out there, listen to God's voice. As we go after adulterous and idolatry, and we will see the consequences of that. Again, this is, this is what is not biblical, scriptural, the way that we preach is that it's all, we're just bad. It's just, oh my gosh, we're just terrible. Right? Like that's, that doesn't actually resolve any. It doesn't you know, motivate us, doesn't encourage us. It's, oh, it's terrible. But what we do read about, which why I left retail for this reason, if it didn't say what I'm about to read to you, I would go back to retail. Because if it's all just about we're just fools and idiots and we're never going to get it right, we're all just messed up, good luck. No, oh, we flip over a couple of chapters and we read about the heart of God in all of that. And we see in chapter 11 of Hosea, verse 8, oh, write it down, mark up your Bible, crease the pages for crying out loud, do all that good stuff. Hosea, verse 11, uh, or chapter 8, or I got, I'm so messed up. It's so good, I'm excited. It's 11, verse 8. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I treat you like Adme? How can I make you like that place? All my compassion is aroused. Not my anger, not my wrath, all of my compassion is aroused. Even in the midst of all this destruction, and foolishness, and idolatry. Isn't that wonderful news? And when you think about those two communities, I was like, okay, how can I 
give you over to, you know, Ephraim? How can I hand you over? I get that. And then these two places, I'm like, what is that? So when we read in the Old Testament, when, when Sodom and Gomorrah were just so unfaithful that God just blew the communities into splinters, that these two communities were right next to them, and they got destroyed as well. And God is saying, my anger is not aroused and I'm going to smite you, but my compassion is aroused because I love you. And as you turn your back on me, I, I pursue you. I want to be in a relationship with you. Oh, man, come on. We're saved by his unconditional, unmerited, and that's just the love of our God. No matter where you're at. Isn't that wonderful news? And that's what the world doesn't hear. Right? When, when the world thinks about church and Christianity and, and Jesus Christ, they hear foolishness. They, they just hear, I'm a sinner, I'm bad, I'm going to catch on fire if I walk in your building. You know, these are the kind of thoughts that they have. But then the biblical thoughts that we have, which seem like foolishness to people, is God loves you so much. And you're never outside of his plan or his will. That's great news. Eh? So what does that really mean to us today? So let's, let's just do a bit of a, a, an overarching theme here, kind of walk through the Bible of where we're at here today. God took his people out of slavery and bondage out of Egypt, and on Mount Sinai he spoke to them. He got into a covenant relationship with them. He gave them the Ten Commandments. We didn't handle that super well. Um, then God says, we're going to move you to the promised land. We didn't really handle that too well either. Forty years of wandering around, and, and the, the grandkids and the kids had to inherit the promised land. But we actually finally got there. And then in our foolishness, again, we got on the promised land, and we started committing idolatry against God. And we're reading here about Hosea, and, he's, and God's just like, maybe I should cancel my covenant, you would see in some terminology in, in some of the scriptures. Maybe we should just, you know, this marriage is done. This relationship is done. You know, we're going to break this covenant. But instead, we read the verses like this, that God wants to be in a relationship with us, and he'll renew the covenant at his own expense, which looks foolish to us, doesn't it? Because God's so loving, he's so compassionate, and he's so faithful. Let's go back to Hosea chapter 2. We're going to hear more of, of God's love for us. Chapter 2, verse 19 says this, I will betroth you to me for a season, when you're nice, when you get it together, no, forever. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice, in love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness, and you will acknowledge the Lord. Whoa, isn't that just wonderful news? As God keeps loving on us, we will acknowledge him. As he keeps pursuing us, we'll say, God, we can't get away from you because you're all around me. You just care for me so greatly. That just great news. So Israel, even though they are rebellious again, even though they deserve severe consequences, God's love and mercy, again, overpowers that and comes through. Let's go back to Hosea chapter 11. I got it right this time. 11.3 we're going to go to. We're going to go right before 11.8. Listen to what it says, though. Again, as we were, we were just foolish, as we're rocking the wrong way. Listen to what God says about that. As, as, as we're caught up in our sin, verse 3, it says, it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I will help you to walk, taking them by the arms. But they didn't realize it was I who healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. I lifted the yoke off their neck, that yoke of slavery and bondage and all that weight. And I bent down and I fed them. Does that seem like an angry God to you? Who helped you through every situation of life. He was right there with you. He was helping you through all the pain. He was healing you and restoring you and redeeming you. That's our God. Even in the midst of our struggles. Wow, man, that's powerful. Man, that brings tears to my ears. Or tears to my ears. Yeah, that would be weird. That would be foolishness, wouldn't it? I'm having way too much fun with you guys here this morning. So again, even though God really gave up everything, he could have turned, he could have been angry. But in his grace and his mercy, he loved on us. So let's stay there in chapter 11 just for a second. We did read verse 8 already. Let's just read verse 9 now. Even in the midst of all of that, I will not carry out my fierce anger. See, again, we've got, to, we've got to have verses like that. Nor will I turn and devastate Ephraim. For I am God, and I am not a man. That is so important for us to know that. The Holy One among you, I will not come in wrath. Isn't that just great to hear? I'm not going to come just to beat you up. I'm coming to love you. 
coming to redeem you. I'm coming to bring you back into a relationship with me. So what does that look like uh, for the future for us? How does that help us? So let's just go over the page here to chapter 14. We're kind of closing this off. We're getting near the end of the book here. We're kind of doing a brief overview. Hosea chapter 14, verses 4 and 5 says this. I will heal their waywardness and love them freely, for my anger has turned away from them. I will be like the dew to Israel. He will blossom like a lily, like a cedar of Lebanon. He will send down its roots. It'll be a good foundation, firm roots in Christ. You know, a tree from Lebanon is ridiculous. When I moved from Whitehorse, you know, we, we only had trees that would maybe make an outhouse, just tiny little trees, it was so cold, trees didn't grow. I come down here, I walk around Fairy Island, I'm like, uh, you can build something with that tree, right? You know, big old tree, and no wind's blowing that thing down. It has firm roots, a good root system that are connected to the Lord. So God is saying again, I'm going to give you firm roots so that we can grow together. And then what's the conclusion again? How is this helping us today? So we look at the very almost last verse of um, Hosea chapter 14, verse 9. It says this, Who is wise? He will realize these things. Who is discerning? He will understand them. The ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them, but the rebellious stumble in them. When you know the Lord, you know that you're in right standing with him. And and you put down good roots. And you are in a good relationship no matter where you're at. Because just knowing to think about like, I'm just a bad person, I'm a sinner. But do you really know your Savior? More importantly. Because again, it's not about ever like encouraging like, you've got to do better. You've got to get perfect. You've got to figure this out. You've got to get over that. You've got to stop being, you know, stop, stop, be better. All these kind of rules. No, it's about you realizing that God is perfect and holy. And in the midst of that, he is pursuing you. Because he cares for you so much. Even in our unfaithfulness to him, he is so faithful to us. Because God loves you so much and there's nothing you can do about that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let me close in a prayer here with you guys. Father, this morning, I thank you that the Old Testament isn't out of date. I thank you that stories like Hosea's are are not uh, historical things we just look upon, but they're actually living and active. And they help us today to be uh, in right relationship with you. It helps teach us to understand how much you care for us, Father. Father, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you for the Word of God. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're here teaching us. Thank you that you've never given up on us, even though often we've given up on you. We've turned our backs on you. You care for us so much nothing we could do that would ever take that away so father i'm just asking right now that whatever's going on inside of us individually we would give it to you this morning father if there's anything that's really unbiblical in our thinking and our understanding that that would be deleted right now from our thoughts and as we talk about a, a tree from lebanon with good firm roots. I pray that our ideas and our thoughts about you would be based on biblical truths and we would have a good foundation of how much you care for us. Help us to take that away today in Jesus' name. Amen.